Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in Freshman English. And we now turn in our study of Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech. From studying the speech and listening to the speech to now watching the speech. Now my assumption is that you've probably seen this before in your life. If this is your first time to actually see this speech delivered, then welcome and I hope you enjoy it. However, our focus now is primarily using the information that we were studying earlier as it applies to watching. So I'm going to give you a couple of challenges. We're working at level 3A, obviously relating to another text. This is a viewing text now for us. Jot down a couple of things I want you to pay attention to. One, when you study this, I want you to pay attention to the exchange of energy between the speaker, Dr. Dr. King, and the audience. Write it down in your notes. I'm also very interested in what's behind. That is to say the setting of the speech. Two things, write it down. One, he's giving the speech in front of the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C. President Lincoln in a huge monument, for those of you that have ever been to Washington, D.C., to see this monument. It is compelling. You walk up these stairs, you cannot see what's at the top of the stairs. It's constructed that way. And then as you crest the stairs, there's this huge statue of President Lincoln sitting there. You're going to see that. But directly behind Dr. King, while he's speaking, there are a number of people there. You may want to do a little bit of research of who are those people and why, for example, are they dressed the way they're dressed? Who do they represent, right? And then there will be the camera. By the way, note this in your notes. This is our only existent video of this speech. Only one is actually in existence today, which makes this a really important video for us to study. The exchange of energy, that's the first thing. The second thing, we mentioned that this speech was very changed by the very writer of the speech himself, Dr. King. At what point in the speech can you get a sense that he no longer is working with his script anymore? At the beginning of the speech, he'll do this, where he speaks and he looks up and he looks back down. He's reading a speech, right? But at some point in this speech, I'm very interested for you to know when it happens, he leaves the script and he begins to speak. And that becomes the most powerful moment in the speech. All right, here we go. A couple of setup observations to begin with, and then we'll have the speech. What was the dream of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.? He envisioned a time when his children and all children would not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. And how would his dream be achieved? Through peaceful, nonviolent protest, by meeting physical force with soul force. Abraham Lincoln once urged Americans to follow the better angels of our nature. Dr. King inspired millions to do just that. And he chose powerful words, words with depth and beauty to deliver his message. Watch King's speech now, so striking despite the faded black and white footage that is our only record. Be with the people on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C. on that sweltering day in August of 1963. Hear those words meant to be heard. Watch King's expressions and gestures. Feel the power of his delivery. And consider how fortunate we are that this moment in history was preserved so that we may experience it today. I am happy to join with you today in what will go down in history as the greatest demonstration for freedom in the history of our nation. Five score years ago, a great American in whose symbolic shadow we stand today signed the Emancipation Proclamation. This momentous decree came 
as the great beacon light of hope to millions of Negro slaves who had been seared in the flames of withering injustice. It came as a joyous daybreak to end the long night of their captivity. But 100 years later, the Negro still is not free. 100 years later, the life of the Negro is still sadly crippled by the manacles of segregation and the chains of discrimination. 100 years later, the Negro lives on a lonely island of poverty in the midst of a vast ocean of material prosperity. 100 years later, the Negro is still languish in the corners of American society finds himself in exile in his own land. So we've come here today to dramatize a shameful condition. In a sense, we've come to our nation's capital to cash a check. When the architects of our republic wrote the magnificent words of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, they were signing a promissory note to whichever American was to fall out. This note was a promise that all men, yes, black men as well as white men, would be guaranteed the unalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It is obvious today that America has defaulted on this promissory note insofar as her citizens of color are concerned. Instead of honoring this sacred obligation, America has given the Negro people a bad check, a check which has come back marked insufficient funds. content 
will have a rude awakening if the nation returns to business as usual. the Negro has granted his citizenship rights. The whirlwinds of revolt will continue to shake the foundations of our nation until the bright day of justice emerges. But that is something that I must say to my people who stand on the warm threshold which leads into the palace of justice. In the process of gaining our rightful place, we must not be guilty of wrongful deeds. Let us not seek to satisfy our thirst for freedom by drinking from the cup of bitterness and hatred. We must forever conduct our struggle on the high plane of dignity and discipline. We must not allow our creative protests to degenerate into physical violence. Again and again, we must rise to the majestic heights of meeting physical force with soul force. The marvelous new militancy, which has engulfed the Negro community, must not lead us to a distrust of all white people. For many of our white brothers, as evidenced by their presence here today, have come to realize that their destiny is not a blockage. They have come to realize that their freedom is inextricably bound to our freedom. We cannot walk alone. And as we walk, we must make the pledge that we shall always march ahead. We cannot turn back. There are those who are asking the devotees of civil rights, when will you be satisfied? We can never be satisfied as long as the Negro is the victim of the unspeakable horrors of police brutality. We can never be satisfied. As long as our body is heavy with the fatigue of travel, cannot gain lodging in the motels of the highways and the hotels of the city. We cannot be satisfied as long as the Negro's basic mobility is from a smaller ghetto to a larger one. We can never be satisfied as long as our children are stripped of their selfhood and robbed of their dignity by signs stating for rights only. <laughs> we cannot be satisfied as long as a Negro in Mississippi cannot vote and a Negro in New York believes he has nothing for which to vote. <laughs> satisfied and we will not be satisfied until justice rolls down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. I am not unmindful that some of you have come here out of red trials and tribulations. Some of you have come fresh from narrow jail cells. Some of you have come from areas where your quest, quest for freedom left you battered by the storms of persecution, staggered by the winds of police brutality. You have been the veterans of creative suffering, continued to work with the faith that unearned suffering is redemptive. Go back to Mississippi. 
go back to Alabama, go back to South Carolina, go back to Georgia, go back to Louisiana, go back to the slums and ghettos of our northern cities, knowing that somehow this situation can and will be changed. Let us not wallow in the valley of despair. I say to you today, my friend, Even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up, live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners, Will they be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood? I have a dream that one day, even the state of Mississippi, a state sweltering with the heat of injustice, sweltering with the heat of oppression, will be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. I have a dream. My four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream. I have a dream that one day down in Alabama with its vicious races, with its governor having his lips dripping with the words of interposition and nullification. One day right there in Alabama, little black boys and black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and white girls as sisters and brothers. I have a dream today. Tennessee. 
Let freedom ring from every hill and wall hill of Mississippi, from every mountainside.